and bring in here the poor and the disabled and the blind and the lame. And the servant, after returning, said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And then the master told the servant, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled with guests. For I tell you, not one of those who were invited and declined will taste my dinner. So the context of this story happened a little bit in the earlier part of the chapter. And in, in chapter 14, beginning with verse 1, it begins with this statement. It says, It happened one Sabbath when he went for a meal at the house of one of the ruling Pharisees that they were watching him closely and carefully, hoping to entrap him. So in that verse, we found a couple of items that I want to bear out. The first thing is, Jesus was at a feast much like this one in this story. And this feast was hosted by one of the Pharisees. Now, what's a Pharisee? Pharisee was a ruler, probably a member of the Sanhedrin. He was the upper echelon. He was the, he was the snooty kind, you know what I'm saying? The, the bougie type of the church. And so he, he probably was, uh, had a lot of influence and probably had a lot of money, if you want to know the truth. And so Jesus often ministered to who? Outcasts. Jesus was known for ministering to the outcasts in society. In fact, we see he ate even with Matthew's sinner friends in Matthew 9. So he touched the lepers. You remember the story of the woman that had the issue of blood that was unclean, and he healed her. He ministered to the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He brought salvation to the adulterous Samaritan woman at the well. He was often among those that were the down and outcast. But he also ministered to the up and snooty, I mean up and affluent. And so this feast is one example of that. So Luke, here the book of Luke, he's ministering to the upper echelon of society. Now Jesus was one of those chameleons, man. He can, he can minister to the down and out, he can minister to the ones that are the upper echelon. He, he had that ability to reach and minister to all. The Bible tells us that God's salvation is available to all people. That means all people. How many people? All people. All races. All creed. All economic statuses. All backgrounds. You guys have heard me say this before, but there's going to be some new people and maybe someone on the stream that will catch this. I, I need you to understand this. I'm not patting the bed for some eventual failure for me. That's not what I'm doing, okay? But it really irritates me when I see ministers that have a failure economic moral ethical whatever and the very people that he spent his life pouring out to protect and to love and to encourage and to strengthen and to put together when their marriages were were terrible and and he spent all these hours and time just loving them and blessing them and helping them showing up at the hospital burying their dead kissing their babies doing baby dedications baptism all this stuff spent his life pouring out for them and he messes up i'm not justifying the mess up I'm saying that we ought to have as much grace for them in their hour of need as we expected them to have for us when we were the screw-ups. Does that make sense? Because watch this. The, the Bible says there is none without sin. No, not one. So I don't care how perfect you think your pastor, minister, or, or, or televangelist on TV is. He's not. There is none without sin. No, not one. And since we know that none of us are sinless, then we understand that we're all covered by the blood and if we're all covered by the blood then who am i to point a finger at you and who are you to point a finger at me we're all covered by the blood if it wasn't for the blood of jesus we'd all be messed up yeah. ah i feel better got that one out <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor no one should be excluded from the opportunity of hearing about and the opportunity to receive eternal life all have the same basic need for that salvation. I don't know if she'll ever see this, but there's a, there's a lady on a particular street corner that I pass frequently going back and forth to church. And uh, an older lady, and I mean her skin is like leather, She's in the sun, and she ain't using no sunscreen. 
And so she'll stand up there with this little cardboard sign, and when you pull up to the stoplight, if you don't look at her, she'll walk up to your car and go. And then when people see her and they go, then she's like, oh, okay. And then, and then walk back. But watch this. I wondered to myself, because I saw it happen today. I wondered to myself, I wonder how many people were compelled to give because she came up to the door instead of staying on the curb. There, had to be, there has to be return for that, or why else would she do it? So, nosy me, I'm in Walmart last night buying Italian sweet cream. What else? And, uh, and so... I figured I needed to put some steps in because I'd spent too much time behind the computer, and so I needed to walk a little bit. So I got me a cart and I pushed it around with just that one bottle of sweet cream in there. Who did I see roaming in Walmart but that lady? And I thought, you know, I probably shouldn't even care, but I do. <laughs> What's she buying? So I thought, no, I'm not going to mess with that. That's between her and the Lord. So I left. I had a bunch of errands to do. I went out to eat with my kids. And on the way home, guess who's sitting at the bus stop waiting on, waiting on the bus with all her, her sacks from, from Walmart? Now, one side of me has the capacity to get a little irritated. But the other side of me says, I don't know too many people her age going to get up first crack of the morning, hold up a cardboard sign. I don't mean from 9 to 5. I mean like from 6 to 9, 10 o'clock at night. And it made me wonder. I wonder who she's got at home. I wonder if she's taking care of grandkids. I wonder if she's got some latchkey kids. I wonder if she's got some illness that she's trying to fund the doctor. You, see, you catch what I'm saying? Because we, we only know what we see, and we make assumptions based on what we see. So I was at the chiropractic office today, and they have a new staff member. And the other people who knew me said, oh, oh hey, hey, this is our, this is our IT guy. And uh, I said, yeah, let me, let me, let me show you let me see what happens when I scan my card. I scan my card. Please see the front desk. I said, that's what I've been getting at in all my high school years. Please go to the office. And so uh, then they told us, well, he's also a pastor. And I said, I looked at her and I said, don't judge me. Because the moment somebody hears that you're a pastor or a minister, an evangelist, or any kind of other stuff, that all of a sudden everything shifts how they view you. So I, just, I said, don't judge me. Oh, no, 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 I, I wouldn't judge. Yes, you did. We have presumptions. We have, we have these, these assumptions about who people are. No what's happening in their life. But I promise you, salvation is for every one of them. And so I catch myself when I view these people, and it occurs to me, there is, a, there is another soul in that little lady with weathered skin out in the heat Every day, just like there is in you and me. And then I began to wonder. wonder how many people talked to her. I don't mean, got some change. I mean, I wonder how many people talked to her. Because I, I thought about this in the store. I can't be the only one. In fact, as soon as I said this little old lady on the street corner, I mean, people's already shouting out where it's at, okay? So I can't be the only one who knows this lady and recognizes who she is, right? And I wondered, she's shopping at the same Walmart that she outside of every day. And I'm sitting here thinking, now, if I was her, I might would go down to the Walmart down there, <laughs> You, you catch it. I'm sorry. Is this the, am I the only one who has these kind of weird thoughts that run through my head and think about? Because now, now let's make it personal. Nobody's going to complain when that little old lady or anybody else comes and shops at Walmart. Why? Because they understand that everybody need what Walmart got. Everybody need diaper genies. Everybody need deodorant. Everybody needs soap. Come on. Everybody need toilet paper for the love. Every, everybody, everybody need toilet paper. 
right? So nobody thinks anything weird of, why are you here in the store? They know why you're in the store, because you need the goods that's there. But it, all of a sudden things change, because now we're not at Walmart, we're at church. I wonder why they're going here. I wonder why they got to be sitting, sitting next to me, sitting in my row, my seat. I can't see through their big head. I can't. I don't know why they got to be sitting. Come on. And then watch this. Oh, look. Oh, look. Altar call. You know they're going down again. Mark, set your watch. Ready? Because you, you know. As soon as he said, last amen. But I'm going to be up here to pray for you. Why? You know they're going up there. You catch what I'm saying? We, we have this, this assumption of the needs or perceived needs or needs that they think they have that we don't think they have. Here's the issue. The gospel is for every body. Every soul. When you and I were in the womb, I think God did to us what he did to Adam. With Adam, he grabbed a bunch of dirt. With us, he grabbed a bunch of cells. And he went, <gasps> and we went, <sighs> so every person, no matter how tall, how big, how little, how smelly, how sticky, come on. No matter what they look like, soft, smooth skin or, or leather charred, every person who's drawn a breath, that breath came from one place. I'm really going, going somewhere with this because God's fixing a shift to us. Oh, God. There's a shift happening. I need to make a statement. I'm not looking for people like me. I'm not looking for people like me. I've decided to leave that to the Lord. Years ago, when I, was, uh, when I started off as a youth pastor, we had seven kids. Seven. That was our best number. Sometimes it was five or six, but... You, you know when you're telling how, how many people you run and you always pick the highest, the highest number was seven. And I was really struggling to grow that. And I was brought onto the church for the purpose of growing the youth ministry. And I prayed one of those prayers. You remember the first one I prayed, Lord, if, I mean, I'm 13. If, if I'm done, I'm done. But if you want to let me live, then I'll do whatever you want me to do. That was the first one the Lord loves to play on loop for me. And the second one was this. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, give me all the kids that nobody else wants. Give me all the kids that don't fit in the other churches, the other youth groups, the ones that are outcast, put down, no names. Give me, give me those kids. And I said, I'll build a youth ministry out of those kids. What do you do? Exactly what I asked for. We were running over 100 kids, 100, 100, about 107 to 115 on average. Sometimes we hit 125, 130. Kids, teenagers, teenagers, 7th to 12th grade. I was at lunch today sitting, a, sitting in Chilinos outside looking across the street at Capitol Hill thinking I used, to, I used to go over there as a youth pastor. Southeast High School, I used to go over there as a youth pastor. And I'd have to go to the front desk and sign in and say, now you know you can't talk to these kids about Jesus. Oh, I know. <laughs> go sit down and pray over their meal and talk about Jesus. Yeah. Where do you live? I live over 36th in Portland. You want to go to church? Oh, my mom and dad won't take me. Well, I'm driving a big old hoopty bus, 1950 Bluebird. You want to ride? Well, yeah, I'm right. I man, I'm taking down names, phone numbers, addresses. Do you know it was not uncommon for me to get home after youth group sometime 10 30 to 12 30 at night, depending on what's happened, just driving that. Yeah. 
all over there. Watch this. This neighborhood had no idea God was going to bring me back. Watch what I'm saying. We're looking for, we're looking for property. And I think the assumption is we'd like a little bit more affluent, cleaner, safer place to be. Because, guys, it is not uncommon. In fact, it's easier to count the days that I'm up here and I don't hear gunshots than it is to count the days that I do. Y'all think I'm playing. I'm not playing. There was one night uh, I left and there was one of the ladies from the church and, and uh, two or three youth that was sitting out in the parking lot in a couple of cars. They were just visiting. A couple of cars come just, whoa, just running through here, shooting at each other. In fact, we found, we found two bullet holes in a house across the street. Some of y'all thinking, well, I'm going to be thinking about, well, now I'm going to come back to this church. Now watch this. The people in those cars need Jesus. The people in this neighborhood hearing gunshots all the time need Jesus. The people that come from outside this neighborhood to this house need Jesus. The people on the street corner need Jesus. The police officers working in this neighborhood need Jesus. But we get involved in church, and we want to know, what's your benefits package if I join your church? How many ministries you got? How many times a year can I get financial assistance? Y'all think I'm playing. We look at church as a, as a governmental program, a welfare from God. But the truth is, this really ought to be the Votech. People, people have no problem showing up if you're going to give them free food and free drink and free toilet paper. But if, if you say, hey, we're having a work day. Oh, I, 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 I got stuff I got, I got to be doing. I'm sorry, I can't be there for work day. Y'all know I'm messing with you right now because we haven't had a work day. Some of y'all looking, did I miss something? We haven't had one. Okay? Jesus was such a rebel, he not only healed people, he did it when they told him he couldn't. <laughs> he, oh, God help me. Can I just say it like this? The Pharisees and the Sadducees wasn't healing nobody. But the people that wasn't doing no healing had the rules of telling the one who was doing the healing if and when he could. I'm sorry, maybe that was just ironic to me. I just, that kind of blows my mind just a little bit. So a, a pastor tells a story of the need of all people in society. He said it like this. He said in one city, he said we planted a church in the poor part of town. Other churches had moved from the area to the suburb and it left a need in the area. And it was where the drug dealers and prostitutes operated. God gave us some very dedicated leaders to help with the outreach. But in time, people from the affluent side of town began to drive to our services. To my surprise, some of those faithful leaders were upset that those people were coming to the church. They were upset that I was giving them opportunity for ministry. And out of their own insecurities, the leaders were rejecting people who were more, educa more educated and affluent than they were. See, you expected me to say that it was the more affluent people that was upset at the poor people for being there, but it wasn't. It was the poor people that was upset that the, the more affluent people were being there. It goes both ways. Sometimes, sometimes we're just dumb. We miss a divine setup because we assume something's going on that's not. He goes on to say, he said, I remember med uh, mediating a conflict for a church that had been the premier church of the city. They had begun to lose their status in the community. God help me. That hurts to say out loud. They had begun to lose that status in the community and were not responding well to the loss. 
So part of the reason for their conflict was a disagreement about how to get that status back. And as we investigated the conflict, we found out that a meatpacking plant had been established in the community and a large influx of poor Hispanic people had moved into the area. And many had visited this church and were rejected by the congregation. Now that's counterintuitive, man. We ought to be drawing people, not rejecting people. So that church wanted to grow, but they wanted to grow with people that were just like them. It wasn't a pleasant task to confront those leaders about God's displeasure over their attitude toward those who were poorer than they. My Bible still says in the book of John, whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So we move on to get down to verses 7 to 14. And this meal is followed, or this event rather is followed with instruction by Jesus that confronted some prideful behavior. Can I just tell you, it's not just affluent people that have pride problems. People that are not affluent have pride problems. Oh. I've told you this one before, but it just bears noting. I'd made friends with some of the homeless in the area. Some of them were coming to no excuses when we were at the restaurant at 59th and Western. So one day I pulled into Brahms and I see somebody I know. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm going up the street here. Jersey Mike's, I'm going to get me a sandwich. I said, you want me to get you one? Been out on the street all day long hot and sweaty you had anything to eat no all right i'm i'm gonna go buy me a sandwich you want one oh i, I don't i don't like jersey mics but if you want to run down over there and go get me something it's so and so and such and such so i just looked at him i said obviously you ain't hungry yet i got my vehicle and i drove but we're supposed to we're sp pride works from both angles you hear what I'm saying? How did Jesus deal with it? First, he confronted the practice of taking the more honored seat at the meal, self-promotion. Listen, I expect that from kids. You know what I mean? You go to a banquet, they want the cushiest, tallest, nicest, widest, plushest seat there is. They don't wait for the guest of honor. It's kind of like going to a wedding uh, reception. And you got the table set for the bride and groom, and kids run right over there and get right to the groom and bride's seat. Just, yeah, where's the punch? <laughs> I got your punch. <laughs> so Jesus had to address some of that arrogance. But here's the problem. Arrogant people don't like correction. Arrogant people don't like correction. And the moment you say something to them about, hey, you, you might not have, should have done it like that, how dare, who are you? I pay your salary. I, blah, 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 blah. <sighs> One of the guys tried that in verse 15. Blessed is he who shall eat the bread of the kingdom of God. That's, that's what I asked people. Say, hey, where do you go to church? Oh, well, bless the Lord, brother. How are you doing today? They quote some arbitrary scripture. Just, or something that they think might be scripture because they're trying to connect they're trying y'all hear anything i'm saying listen i want to tell you jesus ministered to the down and out and to the up and snooty everywhere in between and you and i need to have the same ability that no matter what season of life somebody's in young old destitute or millions and millions of dollars we can relate. We can talk to them. We can have a conversation. We can be their friend. We can encourage them. We can bless them. We can pray for them. We can cast the devil out of them. Nobody hear what I'm saying? Ministry is ministry. I'm going to tell you what. When people come for deliverance, I've had them from this end and that end. The devil the same. He don't care. Same devil. 
If we can understand the deliverance, it's the same devil. Why can't we see in salvation it's the same Lord? I'm trying to calibrate without, without breaking Humpty Dumpty in your life. I'm try to, trying to calibrate your way of thinking. Because I really believe that God is about to bring some folk into, the, into our fellowship that may not at first blush look like they fit. And you might start questioning whether or not you fit based on the influx of people that you think may, they may not fit. And I'm just trying to tell you, if, if you have a breath covered in skin, you fit. <laughs> Some of y'all, like, you reached over real quiet and just got your seatbelt thought, I don't know where he's going, but I am. <laughs> Who did Jesus invite? In this story, the, the man produ producing the feast represents God. The, the feast represents salvation, and the servant that goes out and invites everybody for Jesus represents not only Jesus, but all of us, okay? So the, the feast is the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's inviting everybody to come. So in verses 16 and 17, it, it tells that. It says, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many. How many did he invite? Many. And he sent his servant at supper time. When? At supper time to say to those who were invited. He didn't go up to somebody that didn't know that the meal was being prepared and say, hey, I know you didn't know about this, but you haven't had time. These are people that RSVP. Do you understand me? They, I said, listen, on this day, at this date, at this place, we're having a meal, and I'm preparing it for you, and I would love for you to come. Are you coming? Yes or no? So I know how much. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. In fact, I'm going to bring five people with me. Okay, one plus five equals six. I, I got you down for six. So I have all this food that I'm making, I've made sure I got six plates plus some extra for you with the five that you're bringing. And so now I send Stephen. I say, hey, go tell him it's time. So Stephen comes and says, hey, it's time for dinner. And that's when the excuses started flowing. They already said, I'm coming. You can count on me. Make the preparation. I'll eat my fill. You better make sure there's enough food. You're going to go broke at me because I'm coming with a hungry belly. That's, you know how many people time, how, how many people time, how many times people have told me, oh man, I found my church. Oh my goodness, I walked in, I just knew the moment, I, oh my goodness, I, I'll be here until Jesus come or until he takes me. I tell my wife, mark it. <laughs> Two weeks at max. Now there's one or two that's broken down mode. I just, I just see some of y'all get a little offended. Well, I told him and I'm still... I'm just saying, as a general rule, as a general rule, they're out. I had one. <laughs> I had one. Come right up here. Right here. Right here. And said, listen, don't think me strange. And I, I don't mean to, to stir up some negative emotion in you. But I know you've been a little on the downside since Cameron passed, and I just want you to know I, want, I, I just want to be here to take his place. Do you know I haven't seen him since? Not since. Not since. And that was about a year ago. RSVP rang the triangle bell. Come and get it. And people started sending back excuses. I'm not going to, I can preach this, but I'm not going to. Trying to save time because Joseph is old enough, he needs his rest. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that he can get home at a decent hour. So all the invitees gave excuses for not coming. And on the surface, the excuses sounded real spiritual. And watch this, they sounded legitimate. But they weren't legitimate, they were cover. How many has ever received or given a backhanded compliment? It sounded like a compliment, but you went, oh, oh. Huh? Because you caught it. Right in the face is where you caught it. The excuse that is offered typically does not deceive the party that's receiving the excuse. They know the moment they hear it, it's an excuse. And somehow we think that any excuse that we offer to God, that we've got him tricked because it sounded so legit and so real that he couldn't possibly know that it's not the truth. I want you to hear that it's a very dangerous thing to become an excuse maker. It's a dangerous thing to become an excuse maker. 
You can, you can really excuse yourself out of just about anything, can't you? Well, I would have voted, but the weather was really nasty that day. Huh? How about that? I would have been to church, but I really had a demanding week, and I, I just needed my rest. Y'all think I'm picking on that. I am just a little bit. Because I'm going to tell you what, when I don't sleep and the devil been messing with me all night and I'm fighting and everything tooth and toenail to, in order to bring the message and I show up on Sunday that doesn't meet until 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I got people text me saying, I'm so sorry, I'm just tired. I'm thinking, it's just, uh, so am I. I want you to hear that the church is always full of people that had a demanding week. Who's had a week from Hades this, this week? So hold it high. Look at this. You always find people in the house that had a tough week. I don't know how many of you broke your collarbone in two places outside of Earl and still decided to show up without any pain meds, but he's still here. What's your excuse? D.L. Moody said, a man may excuse himself into hell, but never out of it. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 10. For we believers will be called to account and must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad. That is, each will be held responsible for his actions purposes goals motives the use or misuse of his time opportunities and abilities i need you to know that when you stand before god any excuse that you give him will be worthless that's why the church name is no excuses because none of it is going to make any difference when you stand before him Nehemiah had all kinds of obstacles when he was uh, building the wall of Jerusalem. He could have given a long list of excuses as to why he couldn't get it done in a timely fashion or even at all. But instead, he pressed through all the obstacles and he built the wall that God told him to build. i got to ask you this. Where did God tell you to go? Where did God tell you to plant yourself? Where did God tell you to work? Who did God tell you to marry? What did God tell you to do? Where, what did God call you to do? What has God anointed you for? All these things matter. In the ingredients of your life. Can you imagine George Washington sending an email back? Well, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to fight, but it's awful cold out there. George Washington was outnumbered and losing every engagement with the British. Congress wasn't even providing him adequate supplies. The weather was harsh. And he had a volunteer army that was diminishing as their commissions were expiring. All of that looked justifiable. Who could blame him that he couldn't finish the fight? I want you to hear that excuses and justification are the same thing. Justifying why you can't is just another name for an excuse of a choice. So instead of offering excuses, he took bold action. And I want to tell you, that's still on the plate today. That is exactly what we have to do. We're either going to offer excuses or bold action. God told Israel to conquer the promised land. You know the story. Twelve spies went out. Two came back and said, we're well able. Ten said, there's no way in the world. The cities are walled and fortified. The people are strong. There's giants in the land. We thought this was going to be easy, but it's just too hard. And that's when Caleb basically said, away with your excuses, God's told us to do this, and this is what we're going to do. Excuses really are for people who have simply chosen to not do what God said. <laughs> ah! Excuses, that's what they are. It's, just, it's for people that have already determined, I'm not going to obey God. There really is a difference between a reason and an excuse. You're aware of that, right? A reason is something that really makes it impossible to fulfill the obligation. A couple examples, you know, somebody planned to go to a feast, but they were hit by a truck and found themselves in a coma. I would say that's a good reason that they were not at the meal. Johnny planned to be at the, at the feast, but instead he got COVID, was very sick, and he did not want to infect others. That, that's a reason. 
And I appreciate so much the people of this house that when you find yourself sick and contagious, you'll send me a text or an IM and say, listen, I'd love to be there, but I can't be there because I don't want to share the germs that I have. I applaud that. That's wisdom. That's a reason. But excuses have the ability to look a lot like valid reasons. But they're designed to let people off the hook and leave them not feeling too bad about not fulfilling their obligations. You know how many times I've said, hey, you going to be at church on Sunday? They said, well, listen, I, I don't want to lie to you. So I'm just going to say I'm going to try. What do you mean try? Is that what you tell your employer? I know that, that you have hired me on the hour, by the hour, and that I'm on the schedule for Monday morning. I will try to be there. See how well that flies. Tell your spouse, I will try to be faithful to you. I'm sorry, is this on? (laughs) Here's one that I would have thought probably was a reason. In Luke 6, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue and there was a man that had a withered hand. You guys know that story? Jesus told him to stretch out his withered hand. That's, That's like going up to somebody that's a paraplegic. And they're in a wheelchair and their legs don't work. And saying, why don't you just stand up and walk? So the man with the withered hand had a very good excuse not to do that. He could have, he could have responded and said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It, it won't go. It's withered. But instead, oh. <laughs> he didn't say he couldn't. He didn't say, I haven't been able to do that in years. Jesus said, stretch it out. And so the man with a withered hand, how many have ever seen somebody with a withered hand? It's not just drawn up, but over time, it, it atrophies. I was going down Shields, and I saw another lady with a cardboard sign, but she had one of those walkers. And she'd kind of manhandled around and whatnot. I thought, does she really need that? And so she passed by my truck, and as I looked back, because wa- I want to know. And so she's walking, I see one leg, the calf is that big, and the other leg, the calf is that big. Now, I'm no rocket scientist, but I, I figured that out. Because she, she'd get irritated with the small leg, and she'd start kicking. You could just see the frustration. Come on. That's why she had that walker, and then, and then she'd get that walker stuck in it and uh, pull it up. You're just having a bad day. But if you see somebody who's really got a withered hand, this hand might be this big around compared to this arm that's this big around because it hasn't been used. So it was no small thing when Jesus walked up and said, stretch it out. I mean, I can imagine the guy going, I never thought about that. Maybe I ought to just stretch out this with it. Huh? But he didn't. I, I believe there was something powerful in the voice of Jesus. I believe there was something that reminded him. I've heard that voice someplace before. I believe there was such authority and power there that he thought, this guy's not just saying that to mess with me. There's something going on. So I'm just going to attempt to do it. And as he began to move that thing, all of a sudden, snap, crackle, and pop, and twist, and turn. <gasps> Now, I don't know about you, but God has never asked me to do anything in my estimation that's as difficult as stretching out a withered, maimed arm. Has he you? There's something different that happens when God speaks. Oh, yes, I am, Lord. Yes, I am. There's something that happens when God speaks. When, uh, when my sister and I were much younger and mom and dad was going to leave, it was not an uncommon thing for mom or dad to say, okay, son, now, now you're in charge. And if I had gotten in trouble, then they'd look at Jan and say, okay, you're in charge until I get home. And I'm like, Huh? So then after they're gone, we'd, we'd have a fight. 
You know I'm in trouble. No, they said I. No, that's not what they said. You know I. Huh? There's a, there's a fight over position. There, there's, a, there's a fight over authority that's taking place. And we have people that are in the same room, the same line. you got people like Dennis or Brad or whatnot. Nigel comes in, and they're prophesying. They're releasing, hey, you are called as an evangelist. You are called as a prophet. You are called as a pastor. And we got people in the same row going, oh, I felt the anointing. When that pastor thing was released to him, it jumped off and got on me too. So I just, and we got people that want it so bad that they try to make it happen in their life. And isn't that amazing that the people that it did happen in their life are trying hard to keep it from coming to fulfillment in their life. It's the biggest conundrum in my mind. People that receive the anointing are like, oh, and people that God didn't call it out, it's me, 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 it's me, it's mine. That's why when people come walking up to me saying, listen, put me on the dock and I'm called to preach. I'm like, huh. You catch anything I'm saying? Because when you understand the weight of it, you don't necessarily run to it, but at the same time, you, you want to function in obedience. Some of the most effective people in the ministry that I'm aware of had a Jonah mentality before God got, really got them. That's too big for you guys right now. You're looking at me weird. I'll just move on. Go ahead and tell God why you can't minister when he called you to minister. Go ahead and tell God why you can't witness. Go ahead and tell God it was too difficult, too many people around. They were frowning at you. You were hacking people off. Go ahead, go ahead and tell God that it's inconvenient. You know how many times I've gotten a phone call from somebody that needed deliverance? I'm in Home Depot, Walmart, Chilinos. I cleared the veranda today. Had somebody call me and said, listen, I'm in a mess. I need you to pray. And I did. And when I got done, there wasn't nobody else anywhere around me. Everybody's cleared out. Because I'm not praying. In the mighty name of Jesus, release them. Huh? I mean, I'm out loud praying like I pray right now. In the mighty name, you take your hands off him right now in the mighty name of Jesus. You go straight to the pit that you came from. Huh? Listen, be who you are. Wear it. I just can't pray for them, Lord. Too many people around. Somebody might hear me. In verse 21 and 23 of Luke 14, then the master of the house became angry. Why was he angry? Yes, Lord, I'll be that minister you call. Yes, Lord, I'll pray. You just name the time. I'll pray. Bless God. I'll pray up a start. Yes. Yeah. So he calls us up to do that because we've already committed that we will. And we go, Lord, I couldn't do that. I mean, I know that's what I said, but, you know, you, you, you did this to me because if you had just done this when I was in private, in privacy in my car, I could have done this. But you didn't. You waited until I was in the middle of the line. And, and so the people that were invited that RSVP'd, offered excuses and the bible says the master became angry and so he said go quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind Whew. guys this is happening to me very organically and as i'm going okay so let me let me just let me just tell you the word that's that's coming up on the inside of me as this is happening The Bible says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to try to build it. Okay? When we started the church, I didn't get on Facebook and look and say, well, I think they might want to come. I don't think they're going to church nowhere. Let me try that one. Let me, let me reach over here and try this one. 
it's some of the people that I least expected to show up that shows up. And the people I thought were going to be, man, they're going to be pillars in the house. Man, we're going to be able to build tall on them, them, them ones. I'm going to man, I can't wait to get them to go. And, and they're, here's what I believe God is doing. God said, listen, y'all been trying to build a church this way and that way and trying this program and that effect and, and this, this advertising agent and all these things. How about you let me build a house and let me bring the people that are supposed to be there? Here's the point, though. Here's the point. You've got to recognize them when they show up. Oh, oh, oh. You have to know that when they walk in the door, you can't look at them and say, what are you doing here? Why would you come all, why would you come? You, you live in, you, you live in Purcell. What, 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 what are you doing over Because God's trying to populate the house like he's populating heaven. All kinds of different colors. All different kinds of different languages. I invited somebody to church today. And I said, uh, where are you going? Oh, I don't go. I said, oh, here it comes. No, 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 I just moved here. I said, how long have you been here? Five months. I said, you ain't found a church it's sitting on every street corner. You ain't find one in five months? Well, I ain't found one like, like I'm looking for. I said, really, what's that? And I'm probably going to mess up the name. Rockefellian? What's that? Restafarian. Rastafarian. I said, oh, she goes, oh, we're, we're Christian. We believe in Jesus. It's just, it's just the language we speak. Okay. I said, well, spice it up for us because we, we, we like new languages. And so later came out, she got a fiancé. But that fiancé is not Rastafarian. I said, now, wait a minute. Back up. You telling me you can't and won't church is not Rastafarian, but you're willing to commit your life to somebody who isn't either. Explain that to me. I said, you do know the name of our church. No excuses. You want one? <laughs> you, you see where I'm at? N nothing that we throw at God is going to stick. It's not even going to matter. In fact, when we stand before him, the light of his presence is so going to pierce our soul that we know we have nothing to offer him. We're just going to be silent. We need to see his hand at work bringing people in. Why, why do you think, even when we're in the restaurants, take the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee. You don't know that your next assignment, your next paycheck, your next job is tied to somebody who's sitting in this room. Where do, where do you think that came from? Because divine appointments and connections are from God. God brings people that we think are happenstance but are divine appointments. Jesus ministered to everybody. You and I are called to do the same. Jesus invites everybody to come to his table. But we know that his responses will be more excuses than those that actually show up. The people that were invited to this meal excused themselves out of the opportunity that God was giving them. And I wonder how many in this room feels the conviction of the Holy Spirit as I read that statement. Because you also have offered God an excuse instead of your presence. An excuse instead of your obedience. Full disclosure, I, I have no specific issue, instance, or problem in mind as I'm sharing this with you. I am not responding to any issues that I'm aware of that are happening in this church. I am so blissfully at peace that our church is so blessed by God that we have more peace than the average church. I am. I'm, I am so blessed in that regard. 
So for those of you sitting there going, well, you know, somebody must have said something to him or he must have taken something I said. It's not like that. But I'm saying when you say yes to Jesus, he doesn't take your excuses for why you didn't, why you didn't show up, why you didn't contribute, why, why you didn't give your time, your talents, why you didn't use the anointing, why you didn't heal them, set them free, deliver them. Why, he's not taking any of that because you already, when you said yes to Jesus, you RSVP'd. So anytime God hits the button and puts the bat signal in the air, you and I are commissioned to come running. Everybody wants the benefits of a mountaintop experience. Nobody wants the pain and scrapes and bleeding that it takes in order to get there. So here's what I believe is happening as I'm talking. This is, this is, this is how I feel I'm being led. I think we're going to have, we already do, but I think to a greater extent we're going to have a full gamut. We're going to have people that are homeless all the way to people that are bougie, Come on. Escalades are going to park next to Pintos. Harleys are going to park next to Suzuki's. Come on. Mopeds. Come on. Bicycles. Because when we walk in here, our value is the same. Society may look at us a little different, but in this room, in this house, in this ministry, not one person has more value than another. You hear what I'm saying? How in the world are we going to be effective at winning people to Jesus and expanding the kingdom if we're only looking for people that look like us? Guys, there's a real reason why half of my, wall, my wardrobe comes from Walmart. And it's not because I'm thrifty. It's because I don't want to dress so snooty that people that can't afford my dress code feel bad about coming. You want to know the real reason Rachel and I's picture is on the sign? Because we were very casual. I was wearing a shirt that was long enough to be a dress. No tie, no vest, no three-piece suit, nothing. We were just, we're average people. Because I want to reach people that are on the street, and I want to reach people that are affluent because every soul has value. Just because one soul figured out how to make money and the other soul didn't should not change their access to heaven. You catch what I'm saying? I mean, honestly, this is probably, this is either a Cameron hand-me-down or a Walmart shirt. My boots, I bought them on special, $99, Wolverines from Academy. I spent $14 on my jeans from Sam's because I like them because they stretch. I ain't going to talk to you about my drawers. That's my business. <laughs> you, you, you hear what I'm saying? Because I, I want to I wanna be all things to all people so that by some means I can save some. I'm not aiming for a particular kind of fish. I'm throwing the net and saying, God, get them. And that's what each of us are called to do. Years ago, I went to Arizona. I think it was Phoenix. Tommy Barnett. That church had to seat 10,000 or better. It was huge. And that's where I, that's where I saw Nikki Cruz. And um, I noticed when I sat down, you know, sometimes our carpet irritates me. I'll see where somebody's been drinking coffee or cocoa or something. They spilt it and they left it. You know what I mean? And I just, I find myself irritated. This looks showroom ready 
compared to what Tommy Barnett's church was. And I was amazed by that. The seat padding was, I mean, I brought more padding than what they provided. And you could see ruts through the carpet, some of it threadbare. And he made a statement from the pulpit. He said, I want you to know that there's a lot of ministries, a lot of churches, and a lot of pastors that will spend all kinds of money on carpet, pews, cushion, smell good for the bathrooms in order to attract people. He said, but I believe that the building is meant to reach people. So the building is going to look like the people that we reach. Battered, tattered, torn, dirty. So let it be a reminder that we're putting our money into souls, not into carpet. Y'all catching anything I'm saying? Every person has value. Our last men's meeting, one of our guys invited somebody who invited a half a dozen or more from the sober living house. There might have been one or two or three of them with ankle bracelets. I don't know. I'm, I'm serious. And you go, man, you're going you gonna to run some people off. Yeah, but if I run them into heaven, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can I just see what my job feels like sometimes? It's people going, oh, what's that? Oh, look at, oh, look at that. And I'm trying to go, come on, come on, come on, come on, stay, stay, oh, stay. Get back in there. Come on, let's go, go. I feel like I'm hurting people just trying to get people. As long as I get them through the gate, oh, they may, okay, let's go back to another one. You, you see what I'm saying? That's, that's what it feels like. I spend so much of my time saying, stay away from that. Leave that person alone. Don't do that. And they're going, I'm with you, Pastor. I'll bet squirrel. <laughs> so here's my ask for you tonight. If you know you're called, if you know you're anointed, If you know your destiny is to win people to Jesus, then can we please stop being selective? Because John 3.16 still says, whosoever will. Last example, then I want to pray for you. Just for your knowledge, this service is taking a a hard right from where I thought we were going to end up. Sometimes I talk to people and I say, what are you doing for the Lord? And I've been guilty of doing the same thing. There's some people that I've invited to church for 10 years or better before they showed up. I don't know if he's going to watch this, this clip or not, but uh, four weeks ago, I had a young man, he ain't so young anymore, um, that years ago manifested demonically in a service when I was the youth pastor. I might have been associate at that point, I don't remember. And he was violent on the floor, just thrashing about. And I pointed at some guy and said, pick him up and take him into that room. And I spent hours, hours, because I wasn't very efficient at kicking out the devil. But around 6 o'clock, he was free. How do I know 6 o'clock? Because we had Sunday night church, and I heard the alarm, ding, ding, as people started coming in the door, and I went, <laughs> what? Years later, I saw him again at his mother's, uh, well, not at his mother's, but somebody else. It was a, a mutual relationship that had passed away, and I went to the funeral. Didn't believe in God, didn't believe in the devil, didn't believe in hell, didn't believe in none of it. And I'd been inviting, 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 inviting. This is a kid that grew up in my youth group. 
four weeks ago, he showed up to one of our men's meetings. And I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? Why are you here? Well, I'm still trying to figure some stuff out, but some things have changed. Here's what I'm trying to say. If I had to spend all my time for these 30 years trying to win that one, how many would I have missed? In sales, we have people that always want to go for the big fish. I want that $100,000 sale. <laughs> Put me on the board. I want that $100,000 sale. And so they only call $100,000 clients. And you get some wiseacre that goes 10 times 10 is 100. So he gets on the phone and he spends, he spends, watch this, he spends $100,000 attitude with $10,000 clients and he wins 10 of them. We have people thinking, if I could just win so-and-so, they would so impact the kingdom of God. Listen, I still pray for Ozzy Osbourne. You laugh. I do. Every time I hear one of his songs come on or I see something flips on social media, I pray for him. Can you imagine what would happen to the heavy metal scene and community if Ozzy came out and said, my life was a farce and I regret that I ever did that, Jesus is the only way, he's my Lord, he's my King, he's my Savior, and when I take my last breath here, I know I'm taking my first breath. Can you imagine what that would do to all the... But I don't spend all my time pursuing Ozzy. Because if I did, you wouldn't be here. And I wonder who's supposed to be here that's not here because it would have inconvenienced us, ran us late, cost us money because you know if they come, I'm going to have to buy their meal, buy them an Uber, going to have to. Ain't nobody ever said ministry was convenient. In fact, that ought to be the number one thing. You do understand by signing on to this Jesus thing, ministry will never be convenient. I've noticed that if my wife, which she hasn't in a very long time, and I'm so blessed and thankful, but if she ever gets really ill, it's at 5.01 p.m. on Friday. When all the doctor's offices are closed and all the pharmacy, you can't get no medicine, you can't. Same thing with our pets. She'll doctor them. No, I don't need to take them to the vet. 5.01 p.m. on Friday. Joel, I think we're going to have to take a... Oh, now we got to go to the ER. We, can't, we just can't do an doctor, doctor's visit. Now we got to take them to the ER. Set your, set your watch to it. So I'm asking you, for those of you that this, this strikes a chord in you, and you realize you might have been putting all your attention in places that didn't need to be. You might have been offering a lot of excuses that sounded really good. In fact, it was so good it convinced you that it really was a real reason and not an excuse to not fulfill and not do what God has said do. Whether it's forsaking not this assembling of yourselves, whether it's giving, whether it's releasing your, your time and your talents, whether it's, it's praying for people, whether it's prophesying, or whatever the case may be. Whatever God has put in you, it's not for you. <laughs> it's not for you. <laughs> It's for me. It's for other people. Just like what he's put in me is not for me. It's for you. And it's for other people. Let's just do it. If you just want to be truthful before God and not try to pray some cowardly prayer in your car on the way home lord i know i should have stood up when he said that but i'm i'm confessing it now if you know you've been offering excuses instead of concerted action and you want to change that tonight stand it right where you're at one two three go 
Lift your hands, except for Earl. He can lift one. Father, you see the hands that are attached to the hearts of the people that you have addressed, called, anointed, pursued, invested in, healed, mended, restored, prophesied over. You've placed your Holy Spirit on the inside of them, not to give them goosebumps, but to give them purpose. I'm asking today by your Holy Spirit that you ignite a greater flame on the inside of them. Forgive us, Lord, for not fanning the little flame, the little spark in our own life, but I'm asking you today, God, to bring the torch of the Holy Spirit again and that you would, you would start a new fire in us all over again. Remind us of your call, your mandate, your holiness. Remind us that no excuses is not just a weird church name. It's a biblical principle. Help us to wear Jesus not just on our hats and t-shirts and gym bags, but may we wear Jesus on our lips, on our tongue, in our eyes, with our ears, with our hands, with our feet, with our money, with our vehicles, with our possessions. May every person standing, arms raised today, be marked in the spirit like Cain was marked in the natural. May people that don't even know who we are walk up and say, I, all I know is I, I see something in you that I need access to. Would you pray for me? Teach us your voice. Teach us your touch. Forgive us for ignoring things and, and blaming it on a twitch or an itch or a, 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 a random thought and help us, God, to act with purpose so that we can see your will playing a purpose that work not only in us but through us and invested in the lives of those that you called us to. Forgive us for looking for people that were like us or more affluent than us. Help us, God, to be faithful with every person that draws your breath in their lungs. Help us to see every individual as somebody that you thought enough of that you built them. And then you put a piece of you on the inside of them so they would live. Draw us with gravitational force into the areas and arenas that you've called us to be. Forgive us for waiting on somebody else to make the first move, to voice an idea. Forgive us for justifying our nonsense because our friends didn't do it either. Put a sense of urgency on the inside of every person under the sound of my voice that the sands through the hourglass are almost finished and the trumpet's going to sound and the sky is going to split and only those that are ready are going. Make us ready, Lord. Make us ready to pray, to sing, to worship, to give, to invest, and ready to go. I give you thanks today. For God giving us people that other churches that bear your name have ostracized and didn't want. Help us to see value in every soul, every life. Help us to exalt the name of Jesus. May we become one as you and the Father are one. And I give you thanks for all of this fulfillment in Jesus' precious name. And all those in agreement said. Amen. For those that have caught this stream in any portion, we say thank you. Thank you for giving us time and attention. I pray that something inspired you, challenged you, 
irritated you, whatever it takes. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to invite you to be a part of the church family here at No Excuses Ministries, south side of Oklahoma City, 2632 Southwest 39th. We meet Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. and Thursday evenings at 6.45 p.m. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.